gonna be talking about managing a remote Mac workforce. And really, this is kind of a spin on it because it's ideas for managing your workforce with a Mac cloud, which is specific to what I do. But, you know, as, as the world has changed, it's, it's kind of a perspective on distributed people in general. Uh, just a level set, uh, my name is Chris Chapman. I'm the CTO of Mac Stadium. I also run the software team, product team, and customer solutions group there. Um, serial tech entrepreneur, which basically means I'm addicted to tech startups or I have ADD, probably both. And then, you know, prior to that, I've been twisting Mac to do things in enterprise since 2004. So, just to give you a, a kind of a view of Mac Stadium and our worldview, we are a, we are a data center for Mac, um, and our kind of worldview is that cloud is a necessary component of the modern computing environment, and that the core community that uses Apple is kind of underserved from the business IT enterprise development side relative to Apple and the cloud. So it's it's our kind of objective in the world to make Apple a first-class cloud citizen uh, in capability and in technology. Um, so what do we do? We transform the consumer product that sits on your desk into something that looks like that rack right there, which is one of our mini racks in one of our mini data centers. And we spend a lot of our life trying to figure out how to make all these wonderfully shaped, beautiful, unique pegs fit into the whole cloud, as it were, um, and work more, again, as a, as a modern cloud environment would, which is an interesting proposition. So um, we want to make life easier for developers and business users. We're very much focused on the business and enterprise and developer side of things. Um, and we're really keen on making a reliable enterprise class cloud, but that it does it the right way with Apple hardware. Um, and it's solutions for Mac on Mac. So that's the who we are. Let's get to the meat of the problem. Um, our services primarily targeted folks that needed to build anything on Apple. You need to build it on a Mac with a Mac. Um, and that's been really, really good. Uh, funny thing happened a couple of years ago on the, on the way to work. Uh, the whole world got a pandemic and the globe went crazy. Um, in addition to that, we've had wonderful global supply chain issues. There's new gig economies. The way workers work today is now hybrid and remote by design and first, not second. So the whole evolution of connectivity and tooling and the demand for workloads wherever the, where you need them really accelerated. I don't think it was something that wasn't going to happen, but these events certainly sort of pushed it to the forefront and forced us all to innovate in ways we probably weren't preparing for right then and there. So that, you know, that said, um, this creates an interesting challenge, especially for those of us who are Mac forward, because in other tool sets, there are clouds where you can get things very easily, you can kind of pull things up on demand, they have sort of different models for usage. Um, but in our world, we're gonna have to start encompassing managed and unmanaged devices, all these different networks, all these different endpoints, and create a bunch of solutions that can glue all that together, and it's honestly table stakes for the modern work environment. Uh, and with Mac, in some cases, the tools are amazing and excellent for the end user, and in some cases, when you're talking about aggregating these systems together, it turns into quite the challenge. So let's get into remote architectures for Mac-centric workers. Um, there's kind of multiple ways to attack this. There's everything lives on-prem. There's sort of a hybrid approach. Things are on and off, or you're kind of building your own special closet or data center where you're sort of still delivering it from the prem, but in a more cloud-like way. And then there's full-on cloud delivery. So on premise. Um, these basically are how anybody starts. You've got a problem. You've got to get people access to stuff. Uh, giant pandemic strikes. You're trying to figure out how to get things going. Usually because of the tools we use and because of what we do, it's challenging with Mac and you feel like you have more control and more security because you can touch it. It's in your hand. It's on your prem. If you want to pull a cable, you pull a cable. Whatever you want to do, you can do. Um, and so that's often the simplest path. 
And honestly, for stakeholders in your organization, if you say, it's in our house, we've got control of it, it's our stuff, that's a pretty easy sell. Everybody tends to agree with that first, and then you dial them in, right? So let's talk about the network here. The first thing is how that network path gets solved. Well, you've got a solid premise-based network, but now you're tasked with keeping it secure in a remote access world, and you're tasked with providing the control outside the walls that doesn't infect inside the walls. So this can be challenging, and it can lead to a bunch of concerns. You often have to work with what is, so the, or the network is the network you have. It's not specially designed for this task. It's designed for what it was designed for, which is local area network. And then when you add in VPNs and DMZs and VLANs, network hops and those types of things, which are valid and necessary for security, they create segmentation and isolation and performance degradation and a complexity to the solution that you maybe weren't anticipating when you first thought, hey, I'll just let somebody dial in. Um, and in the case of Mac assets, you often, because of how things are set up in the office, might even be routing through desktop grade routers or switches to the endpoint, which again, isn't great when you're far away. So it creates kind of a special lab setup scenario where Linux and Windows and other compute live in a certain category and then Mac's kind of deployed in a different way and the network's deployed in a different way and the sort of upkeep is in a different way. So security and provisioning around this, uh, nice Mac lab here, actually really clean. Um, but physical access can still remain a challenge, right? Uh, remote accessing an individual device, you get to that device, if something goes wrong with that device and it needs to be touched or managed or maintained and you can't get there, that's a challenge. Um, troubleshooting and system maintenance are all still physical problems, right? You have the physical Mac, you're just letting someone connect from far. Um, you're still managing a ton of individual systems uh, with policy and data protection, et cetera, et cetera. Provisioning is a procurement exercise still, so you're, you're still providing a device to a person, you're just not there and the person's not there, so it adds that layer. And then updates and upgrades are kind of the same that you'd be used to. Reliability and availability are a single point of concern. If you've ever had a developer with a special Snowflake uh, Mac environment and lives under their desk and it goes offline, and then somebody's driving to the office to reboot it or manage it or take care of it. So environment state is often an issue. Now, I say that with full awareness that there are a massive group of awesome tool providers here that make a lot of that way, 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 way better. So not shooting that part down, just expressing that that's part of the concern you have to address. So that gets us to device access and MDM. That's one bright spot in this type of architecture is there's tons of tools for consistent device management and strategy and enablement and just a general, general overlay that helps you take care of that whole thing. But that still leaves the problem with Mac is not a remote friendly platform. Uh, Apple, for lots of valid reasons, has always expressed that it's about the customer experience the device in the customer's hands and how it feels and looks. And because of that, they've never really leaned very hard into high performance remote access or even a remote access experience at all because their perception and their opinion is that it should be in your hand to get the real experience for the device. That leaves you with legacy tools, third party tools, interesting tools that work to certain different degrees of goodness or badness. So, and, VNC's been around forever in Linux and Unix, and it works for Mac, obviously, too. Um, Apple has screen sharing, but that's not necessarily intended to let you daily drive your device all the time. And then there's things like TeamViewer and stuff like that. These tools are all really geared toward administrative use of the Apple platform and dialing in to help someone or tech support. So it, it, it's not exactly thinking about the user as the user. Um, and then varying degrees of support, because as Apple shifted from Intel to ARM, some people have chosen to remain in the Intel sort of context and Rosetta Emulate, which affects remote performance. Other people have embraced it and developed for silicon, so there are products now that do perform natively on silicon, but a lot of them still emulate. So if you look at like a simple remote access architecture, and this is super simple, 
Uh, you're going to have an office with a desktop. It's probably got a hub or a router in there. It goes up to a switch, and then you've presumably got some switch or firewall. Hopefully, you're bolting a VPN. VPN is a blessing and a curse because VPN is secure, but VPN also really doesn't like streaming protocols and remote access protocols very much. It uh, packet inspects everything, so that's going to happen. You're going to go through a public internet at some point, and then the remote workers, anybody's guess, but hopefully they have Wi-Fi router of some capability and Mac plugged in or, or whatever their endpoint is and happy as they go. Um, so that's kind of the first form factor we can go when we talk about remote access. The next one, we've gone through this and we're like, okay, great, but you know, it'd be, really be better, maybe we fix that lab thing, maybe we put it in the closet, or maybe we convince our data center guys that there's a place for Apple in our data center. Um, I can tell you a list of the words that they'll probably say to you when you say that, but um, we won't talk about that on stage right now. But um, the server room is a way to control it better. The data center is a way to control it better. You get, obviously, physical security right out of the jump. You don't have people walking up to desktops or walking away with desktops or walking in and out. Um, but now you have to go to the special rack. And again, back to what the data center people or the server room people are gonna tell you when you go to put your Macs in those places is, yeah, you, you go over there to the special rack. There's things that you're gonna do that uh, we don't know why you're not using blades. I don't understand what this is. Um, so those are concerns you'll have to architect around. Um, and then the VM, VPNs and DMZs and VLAN concerns are still there. Um, usually in these situations, those are more enterprise ready and scaled in that location. You're just gonna have to adjust to those configurations because again, they're not going to be Mac first by design, so you're gonna have to sort of help your folks through those design considerations to properly use that network infrastructure. And then provisioning and device management. Um, usually it's called put a ticket in or come out to our facility to deal with the mess you've created. Um, because the, they don't like to deal with the Macs. The Macs are different, the Macs are weird. Um, the Macs don't use redundant connectivity and all the other things. Um, so, and then the infra team can't manage them with the same set of tools, typically, that they're using to monitor and do SLA and do provisioning. So you have to come up with sort of systems around that. And there are systems. And then MDM, and sometimes the data center guys get it, and sometimes they look at you and go, I know you want to use MDM, but you're, you're going to be in charge of the host config, right? Because you guys have got these tools, and you're going to change the config in this thing, but it's in my rack, and it's in my data center, so how the heck am I supposed to? And so you get to have that discussion. Um, and then capacity add and remove, again, it's still a special case often, so you'll get things like this tray here and the Macs will go in just so, and they'll have to be delivered in a certain way and plugged up like our friend there with the cabling. Um, so again, there's advantages to doing a, a hybrid cloud because it does have you know, MDM, and again, this is the same as before. You get, you get remote access, but you're gonna have a more robust network. You're gonna have a more robust facility. You theoretically have people on staff watching it all the time. It doesn't walk off. So that's a, that's a better thing. Um, this is kind of a architecture that, again, very, very, very simplified. Office looks the same, right? Corporate data center now in the middle has highly scalable network infrastructure with a highly scalable VPN concentrator hooked up to your racks of Macs. And then your remote worker and your office people presumably hit through VPN and go down into the data center to get what they need. So again, you've created a more consistent service. You haven't saved yourself a lot of problems and there's still some layers and concerns that if you really wanna do this full scale right, cloud right, that you're gonna to need to add to the equation. So let's talk about a full scale integrated cloud service. I guess to me, if you ask me what the difference between a data center and a cloud is, in general, it's a combination of the platforms and services and specific technologies that wrap around all the goodness in there to make it work as a service to the customer. So in general, when you're doing it yourself, you're building what you need to get your infrastructure, but you're maybe not considering all the other parts and pieces, or you simply don't have the stuff you need to build all that. 
So here we go talking about this. Um, when you build a Mac data center, you're gonna wanna focus on a cloud that is Mac focused. I know we had some awesome presentations from folks about networking and security and specific concerns that are a little different in the Mac universe, right? Um, data centers in general are more generic, so you're gonna want to build your data center with those Mac focuses in mind and put services and infrastructure platforms, these MDM tools and management platforms around it. Those things make a massive difference in service delivery and service capability. And then in addition to the normal network and infrastructure pieces, from a platform perspective, you want front end load balancing and connectivity. This is sort of a key difference when you're talking about remote workforce management, right? It's not just dialing into the Mac and hoping for the best. You want to sort of create an experience that no matter where the user is, they're gonna get the best capability they can and they're gonna get an experience they can work with while they have to work in this situation. Um, then additionally, you're gonna want backend security, orchestration, change control management, all the things, right? And you want to keep the user as close to the tool stack that they're used to. So a lot of times when we go into the data center or the cloud, it becomes very generic or one size fits all or form factored because it's trying to accommodate consistency, but you really want your user to have the flexibility and the control and the functionality they have on a desktop because again, we're, we're trying to accommodate them where they are. So I think there's an opportunity for access in a different way. Um, obviously, given who we are and what we do, I'm gonna have an opinion on this that's related to stuff that we do. Um, I'd like to talk to you about cloud access and virtual command. These are two remote access technologies built on top of our Apple data center that contemplate uh, true remote access for workers. Uh, they have sort of different needs and um, concerns to address. And these are sort of the high level designs of those. Um, we'll get into the details here in just a second. Um, but on the cloud access side, it's, it's a, uh, a high performing client that goes through a firewall to physical hosts. So you get a one-to-one -one access. And with virtual command, it is an orchestrated ephemeral offering where you're dialing in and you're getting a web-based desktop that authenticates you to a just-in-time desktop for a workspace. They have different use cases and different applications and different reasons for existing. So let's talk about cloud access. Uh, I don't know if anyone here, any hands heard of Teradici, know what Teradici is, ever seen a Teradici? Yeah, a couple of folks, cool. Yeah, so we partnered with these guys. Um, for those not in the know, Teradici is a protocol called PCOIP. It's been in the Linux and Windows space for a long, long time. It's a remote access protocol, but their goal was to do high speed, high capability, latency tolerant, good stuff. Uh, it ended up being a big deal in the media and entertainment market because of its performance. It's actually won a technical award for the Academy Awards because of its uh, performance. It's used a lot in animation studios and movie houses and sound editing and video editing, um, but it's, it's, it's really, really performant. Um, so you can watch a movie literally remotely and, and have no lag. So the architecture here is in a data center, you're gonna have those racks of Macs. They're managed, they're dedicated, it's a pool. You can have a user get a different one every day but it's one user at a time per Mac. Um, those are persistent, so whatever happens on the Mac stays on the Mac. It's up to what tools and storage and things of that nature that you choose to associate to it if you wanna use OneDrive or Google Drive or Dropbox or something like that. You obviously can accommodate those types of things. You can put MDM, you can enroll them, you can manage them, you can do whatever you would do on-prem it's just in a fixed location and you're accessing them now from a client that you orchestrate on the user desktop space and you have a private IP and public IPs that you can go through firewalls with to get the users to the, to the endpoint. So it's really simple to implement and use. You grab capacity, you grab user seats, you download the clients to any number of people. You can have more clients than actual concurrent people. It's based on concurrency. So when you get into remote access, this is another architectural consideration, so I'll back up a little bit. Um, you often wanna consider the load relative to the performance. 
And load in a remote access environment is based on concurrency because it's the throughput of the remote worker into the remote resource. So it loads both the resource, it loads the throughput. Um, in, in, the, in the case of this uh, service, you want to buy as many concurrent licenses as you think people will be in at the same time. Um, so you download those clients uh, via web link, you connect and access your host, and then you manage and automate your capacity using any preferred MDM or tool set. So there's some engineering on you around this after you get the connectivity. It solves the capacity problem, it solves the security problem, the network problem, and the connectivity problem. It does not solve the customization, the user experience desktop that you want to create for your folks, or any of the identity management or the uh, other tool sets that you might put around that. So the good, the good part is the performance. The extra work part is you're going to have to build all those pieces. But the good part is you have the freedom to build them however you see fit, and they work to do whatever you see fit. So the second one's a bit different. Um, it's a coming soon. So this is a bit of a sneak preak, sneak sneak preview. Um, it's called Virtual Command, um, and it's our own patented web front end technology. Um, it's based on Apple Silicon. I guess backing up since I'm going fast. The uh, the other one, Cloud Access, is based on the Intel Max. That client works on Intel platforms. It is not yet available for Apple Silicon. So as we brought the second grouping into play, we focused explicitly on Apple Silicon. We believe the performance and the graphics capability. And honestly, Apple's excellent, excellent uh, hypervisor framework make this really useful for this stack of technology. Um, you can see up there in the sort of uh, right there's kind of a, a really tiny diagram, but um, it's, it's sort of the, the idea of you're, you're accessing a front end through the web. You, the administrator, control the users, the technology they're going to get, the VMs they're going to get, but you're not really having to carve up the machines or the infrastructure or the virtual machines or anything of that sort. On the back end, you're getting all the Mac capacity, but it's hooked into a network framework and a storage framework to create sort of a virtualized pool of capacity that the web front end accesses for you. And then below that, you've got two pictures here. You've got one, you've got the Apple desktop itself. Um, if you see the fan out on the right there, that's basically how controls work. If you want to get in and out of it, it's uh, sort of a pull out, pop out. And then the bottom is an actual administrative screen of really kind of what you do. You're creating users and tags and groups and picking the sizes of the, the machine that that user gets. In Apple land, it's one or two. Apple is very particular about performance and about the resources that you can split up on a, on a silicon machine. So you can have half the machine or all the machine. Um, but you can create any number of images. Uh, you can set them up with all the tooling that you want. Um, but this is ephemeral, meaning once the user logs in, they're going to get a Mac workspace experience on Apple Silicon. And when they log out, it's going to go away and everything that they did is going with it. So the difference between the two, two approaches is one is probably better for testing or training or security sort of sandbox environments that you want to erase and reset. The other one is more of a persistent day-to-day -day driver kind of a situation. And then these products aside, if you're, you, you know, that's something you should think about when you're asking what remote workforces are doing. Like, are these, you know, contracted temporary workers that need a certain set of tools and a limited amount of interactivity with the environment? Are they long-lived employees who will literally stab their eyes out if you make them use a crappy remote desktop that doesn't have all the things in it every single day? Um, those are kind of concerns around how you're going to architect it, what kind of back end you're going to put into it, and what you want to do with the user. Again, the, the architecture here on Virtual Command is ephemeral. So it's, it's a cloud of Apple compute with storage, with uh, a web interface, with single sign-on, with a uh, web-based role access and policy. That still doesn't mitigate the need for you to put stuff in the desktop images like Xcode, like MDM tooling, like configuration controls, um, profile, that sort of thing. 
Uh, it just means you're baking those into the image. So again, features and controls that this has are custom desktop settings. You can basically giveth and taketh away the application real time. I could be logged in and you could get rid of my desktop and I would not be able to use it. You could bring it back. I would be able to click and use it instantly. Uh, you can change the users. They get invited through your email system. So it seems like you're just inviting them to another service in the company and capacity monitoring. So that every day you log in, you sort of get that view of how many people are actually using this concurrently and how much stuff are they using? And does that mean I need less or more stuff and less or more users? It's a quick, easy way to track who's, how much is being used and if it's being used effectively. And then sort of complementing that as activity and usage logs, which is something, again, this tool aside, if you're doing remote work access, you wanna know who's in your environment, how long they were there, what they touched, how they touched it, why they touched it, were they touching what they were supposed to touch? Um, so these kinds of things are pertinent to make sure that you track. And whether you use something like this or whether you have a, a more intricate logging system or you rely on the VPN logs themselves or the host logs or some combination with MDM, uh, it's definitely a concern you always want to do because in remote workforces now you have to contemplate different types of access. You have comp corporate devices that you're allowing access. Those are probably more well understood, probably managed by an MDM, maybe on a company VPN. You may also have uh, unknown BYOD endpoints with no specific controls attached. And how do you control the data flow from those things into your environment? And how far into your environment are they allowed to go? Um, those are kind of design considerations when you talk about what you're wanting to do and what you're wanting to accomplish. And often it becomes user category based, right? So again, certain types of users, you know, temporary workers, contractors, tr people that are doing a training class, they need very limited access. They don't need a lot of data persistence. They need to come in and out, go quick, and you need to know what they did while they were there. Other people you trust, you know, you lock them in, you configure the tools, you let them live a long time. So on the virtual command side, it's a similar one, two, three, four kind of thing, but you just purchase a cloud with user seats. You log into that portal, you start setting up your users, and then when you get your images going, you put the tools that you care about and you associate those to the images. You associate those images to the users by the tags. So if I have a group of devs, I could call it dev. If I have test, I have test group, and I may have three or four images per. And when the user logs in, they get to see the desktops they pick. They pick one, they get it, they go. So I know I ran super fast. <laughs> but um, that's kind of the overview of, of the cloud and the technologies involved in it. But um, yeah, if you want to find out more, you can check us out on, on our website uh, with cloud access and virtual command, or you can come talk to us at the booth. We've had some pretty awesome conversations with folks because as this topic goes, this is like the super tip of the iceberg. You get into what everybody's doing and what tool sets they're using in VMs and how they're using them, and it becomes an interesting sort of interactive real-time design conversation. Um, that said, I'm gonna take a breath and a sip of water, and if there are questions or things I can answer, I would be super happy to talk about it or ideas we wanna bounce off each other. I'm here for it. Any questions? <clears throat> oh. Hi. Is there a recommended um, requirements for using the service for a user, like download speed or anything? Um, there are uh, bandwidth considerations, uh, much like a VoIP or a uh, video feed. There is a certain amount of latency, jitter, and chop you would want to consider. Um, most, both of these protocols, specifically here, are designed for general web traffic and for pretty significant degrees of latency. So about a 2,000 mile range from the data center is roughly right, depending on the network. And you want probably 200 milliseconds or under from a ping time. Once you get over 200, Teradici technically says 250, but not for high performance. 250 is the edge of performance. Um, and, and, then, and then after that, again, the user sort of 
floating cursor in an aquarium and not real happy with life, but that's probably the consideration. Generally, if you can have broadband, that's preferred, although these are designed to reach into areas where folks have interesting network capabilities. Um, that's one of the things we're trying to target. But high quality network is better, uh, closer to target is better. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think you got away with it. <laughs> Sweet, I nailed it. Thanks All very right. much, Chris. <laughs>